저희 뉴욕 가정 상담소에서 용감 무쌍한 윤정숙 소장님을 소개합니다. 따뜻한 박수로 환영해 주십시오. 안녕하십니까. 용감 무쌍한 뉴욕 가정 상담소 아, 윤정숙 소장입니다. Good evening. Um, welcome to KPC 20, uh, 22nd anniversary benefit dinner. 어, 뉴욕 가정 상담소가 지난 22년 동안 정말 소외되고 힘들어하는 가정과 여성들을 위해서 힘써왔습니다. 그런 일들이 가능했던 것들은 오늘 이 자리에 오신 많은 여러분들이 어, 도와주셨기 때문에 가능했다고 생각합니다. At this event a year ago, we announced KFSC received a $250,000 federal grant to launch the transitional housing program to help survivors of domestic violence with their housing needs. In the video that you're about to watch, you'll hear from one of our clients who benefited from this grant and how she was empowered by the strategy that KFSC put in place. This client, who now started her own business, is here with us tonight. With one ear, we saw tremendous progress for the center and change is the life of our clients. The first, KFC is a proud recipient of two-year, $300,000 grant from U.S. Department of Justice to launch a um, proactive community education and prevention effort. Second, we secure support from Avon Foundations to strengthen our capacity to serve more women with job trainings, ESL classes, legal clinics, and computer skill classes. These programs are vital because financial instability often cause a victim to return the abusers or become homeless. Can you believe that we have served more than 2,000 individuals and families last year? They benefit from our only 24-hour hotline services, counseling, education, childcare, and quality after-school programs. Up next is our 2011 gala video featuring heartbreaking and heartwarming um, stories. I hope that their stories will better paint a picture of how KFSC has been able to help the needs of women men, children, youth, and whole family that who walk into our doors every day. Thank you so much for this honor. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I've always felt a huge debt of gratitude to the Korean community where I grew up here in Queens. Um, and um, my father had a uh, medical practice in Flushing. And I was always uh, very much a part of this community and feel very happy to be back with you. Um, I can't imagine a better way to do that than to be at this wonderful fundraiser for an amazing organization. So it's a real special pleasure to see so many young people and people um, of my generation and also of my parents' generation. My parents are actually here tonight. Um, I don't know where they are. They're both here. My mother has been or involved with this organization for a while. And um, I just wanted to, before I say anything, I just want to say my parents, um, and anything that's good about me, it's because of them. And so, I, <laughs> so um, I wanted to share a few thoughts about immigration and about my own work what led me to my own work today as a law professor. Um, I came to the United States from Seoul when I was six years old. And like many of you, when I arrived, I didn't speak any English at all. And we settled in Jamaica, Queens. And my father, um, who had been uh, trained as a physician in, in Seoul, um, became a, re a medical resident at Brooklyn Jewish Hospital. And we lived very modestly. My father took the subway to work every day. He, um, my mother made our clothes, and we owned very few books and very few toys. And um, so, and I, and I began first grade at a Catholic school in Jamaica. 
and I didn't know any English. And I have to say that I'm, one of the things that, this, that really impresses me about this organization that we're here um, for tonight is the incredible approach of bilingualism, the, the importance of language. Because when I, when I think about my experience of immigration, the experience of language is so important that you, some of you have had this experience. You know how incredibly disorienting, how incredibly difficult it is to be thrust into an environment, in a new environment, and not to understand one word of what's going on all around and to be the only person uh, to feel that deep sense of loneliness uh, and, and just the pain of not being able to understand or communicate. And I don't think I'll ever forget that. I, don't, I think that that feeling will always be with me on some level, even as I have mastered um, the English language and use it, use it every day. Um, I think that um, it is, it's an experience, that, that experience of feeling apart but, and, then, and then feeling like you are able to master something that you didn't know, and that feeling of learning how to survive um, is, it's just a very, I think it's a very important experience for a lot of immigrants, and the fact that this organization, you know, has that approach to thinking about the way that language, the language barrier is one of the things that, that helps people, that, that prevents and then helps people to um, get over their fears and their, their lack of access to, to justice. My um, work today, my work as a professor, as I'm a criminal law teacher and a family law teacher. Um, in general, what I do with my days is sit in front of my computer and, and I write, and I write books, and, I, and then I teach in the classroom. And so primarily, I'm a teacher and a scholar. And, but my work is about, um, a lot of it has been about domestic violence and about family law. And, and in, when I think about how I came to this work, I, I think there are a lot of different influences that, that I've, I've had, but I think it really was the initial experience of immigration and of feeling like there was an enormous distance between the culture that, that I was living in and the culture that I had come from and the feeling of displacement that immigration entails and thinking about the family and thinking about notions of the home. And so the book that I, that I, I wrote um, most recently focused on the idea of the home, what the meaning of the home is in law. And when I started looking at that question, it's, it's a question that I had been very interested in, obsessed with for a long time. What is the home? What does the home mean? What does it mean for a family to be in a home? Um, I discovered that in the area of domestic violence law was where the legal system had done most of its thinking in the last 40 years about that concept, right? And that there were many things that were happening in the, the area of domestic violence law that made the home both special and protected, but at the same time unprotected. And there, that there was this paradox that home was supposed to be this very secure and safe place, um, but at the same time that we had competing notions of privacy and family privacy that was preventing the police from inter intervening. And so my work is about some of the unintended consequences that have come about as a result of a very strong criminal justice response. And I think that um, as I was being introduced, my book was described as challenging. And I think it's, I, I, I take that to be a compliment because I think that the, the book challenges some of the orthodoxies about domestic violence that we've, we've um, come as a society to embrace and looks at some of the ways in which things that we thought were good in terms of criminal justice intervention may have had consequences that we didn't intend or desire. Right? And, so, and I think that that is the kind of thing, that, that's what I do as a scholar. And the fact that I, that, that I reflect on, on these kinds of questions, I think goes extremely well with these, this, uh, an organization like this that focuses on, in effect, an alternative to criminal justice. Because it's not only criminal justice response that is going to help us get through um, figuring out what um, what to do about domestic violence. It's absolutely vital to have something other than a governmental criminal law enforcement response, and that is what this organization does. Um, I'm extremely honored to, to uh, be here with you, and I, and I thank you very much.